Hey, what is going on, everybody? We are back with a brand new episode of I Dang Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Salfamensa. If this is your first time tuning into the podcast or watching the podcast, we love you and we welcome you to this podcast. And hopefully, you'll come back for future episodes. If you're a returning viewer or listener, of the podcast. We welcome you back and we hope that today's episode is one that you find informative, insightful, and enlightening. So today's episode is one that is very important. Uh, We're going to be talking about bilingualism. We're going to be talking about the importance of centering our culturally, linguistically diverse families in our communities and beyond. And I'm just excited to uh, bring on our guest who is doing her doctoral work in this area and is going to bring a lot of profound knowledge and wisdom, you know, when it comes to it. So she's out there in Kansas uh, doing her doctoral at Kansas State University, uh, focus on how we build better relationships with culturally and linguistically diverse families, uh, which is something that we don't talk about enough in our education circles. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on uh, Ms. Latanya Maliotega to the podcast, and we're going to get started with this conversation. Good Welcome. Morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, but, buenos dias. Como estas? Bien usted. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, how are things going? Good. Just uh, enjoying the weather. It was a little bit chilly yesterday, but nice day today um, here in Manhattan, uh, Kansas, where, again, where Kansas State is. Uh, I'm actually again, thinking we're going to have a hot summer, so it's already starting to get warm and humid a little bit, so that's what I'm expecting. How are you doing out there? I'm doing well. Uh, it's pretty cool here in Ethiopia. I think the weather is about 70 degrees, so we've had a bit of a breeze mixed with the sun, which is always a great combination yes. around this time. So it's been pretty decent weather. I can't complain at all. Awesome. That's great. All right. So why don't we get into the conversation? So the first question I always like to ask my guest is to tell us a little bit about yourself and what ultimately brought you into the education field. Well, um, like I said, my name is Latonya Mario Ortega. I'm originally from a small community in northern New Mexico, uh, the land of enchantment called Las Vegas, New Mexico. So the wildest of the wild, wild west. I think you have a question, you know, talk about that a little bit later. Um, yeah. but, anyway, but I acknowledge both of my last names, um, Mario Ortega, because of my father and my mother um, from a small New Mexico town. I had an amazing seventh grade, um, I mean, eighth grade in Spanish through junior year of Spanish that really discussed about how we acknowledge both backgrounds. Um, and with that being said, you know, I acknowledge both last names because it, it's part of my identity. And, and that's what I love, how you talk about identity so much. So I just wanted to bring that in as to why I use Mar y Ortega. The why means why, meaning Mar and Ortega. Uh, my dad was recruited from Kansas to play baseball where he met my mom. Um, and they're both educators. So, um, and also uh, my mother's maiden name was Ortega. So that's why I use the Ortega. So again, um, You know, my mom uh, was an educator, my dad was an educator, and my grandmother also played an active role in my life um, in terms of my bilingualism um, when my dad passed away. So um, my mother is also a director of recruitment and retention at a community college. So my entire life, I have been around um, community college, understanding the importance of college, and I've had that privilege growing up. Also, she was a director of minority STEM programs from the um, you know, Department of Energy through the community college. Um, and the reason why I got into education field was because I moved back home to care for my grandmother who was dying of cancer. And I was in Albuquerque at the University of New Mexico. And I decided to go back home um, because my mom needed help. I'm an only child. She was an only child. Um, and so I, you know, 
at New Mexico Highlands University, um, it's known for teaching, known for instruction, known for social work as well. And so when I went back home, that was the time um, in the beginning, you know, um, the late 90s and into the early 2000s where there are those Title III grants. And we were told, like we were said, you know, we're going to have to get a bilingual and TESOL endorsement right away in your degree. So I decided to get my minor and I was inspired by Dr. Loretta Salazar, um, who was in bilingual education for many years and still is an influence in my state. Um, so I decided I would um, get my degree in education, elementary education, as well as my bilingual and TESOL endorsement. Um, I also decided I would move to an urban area um, where I taught dual language education. So 10 years of my um, education teaching, I taught 10 years of um, dual language instruction, half day English, half day Spanish in a school community, which I adore. Um, that's probably what made me is the Lourdes Gonzalez Elementary School in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and still is a dual language school till to this, to this day. A strong program in that area was a immigrant community, which I'll talk about later. Um, stronger immigrant community, community as well as our heritage language from New Mexico. So in New Mexico, we have an interesting, um, an interesting history, um, which I'll talk about a little bit as we continue. Um, so I decided to go into um, education, I mean, get my master's as so I was working as a teacher in Albuquerque. Um, and so I taught 10 years and as well as I taught in a home literacy program. So I, my advisor okay. for the University of New Mexico, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So my advisor um, from, yeah, so that's, that's basically where it is. Um, but how I got into family engagement, we can discuss that. But that's how I got into education. So it's a little bit by accident in a way, but I always love children. Awesome. And you mentioned early while you're talking about your path to education that, you know, you really are intentional about centering your heritage. So yeah. I know in this day and age, we're very much more race conscious um, in terms of terminology and nomenclature. So I know, you know, Latinx terms out there, but you're very intentional about saying that you're a Chicana, yes. right? Yeah. And I want you to talk more about that. Um, how, like, how do you center your Chicana heritage and what you do as a teacher and how has it shaped your development overall in the field? Um, so I was approached by Dr. Uh, Dr. Taylor to work on a, on a article in uh, at Kansas State with three other Latinas or four other Latinas. And she asked me, what do you identify as? And I'm like, well, I'm here in Kansas. So I say Latinx or Latina, but in New Mexico, I say Chicana. If I'm in the Southwest part of New Mexico or in California, or depending on who I'm speaking to, I usually say Chicana because that's who I am. Um, you know, I had an amazing seventh grade teacher that taught me about our New Mexico history. Um, we have a strong, um, in my town, we had a strong uh, New Mexico history education. And then when I went to, went to college, I learned a lot more. I mean, Dr. Lujan was an amazing um uh, teacher. And so um, the history of New Mexico is different. You know, it's, it's, it's really original. You know, we, New Mexico was um, colonized before, you know, even before the 13 colonies. And so it started, you know, down with the Incas into the Mayas into the Aztec, you know, were colonized by the Spanish. And when they you know, in 1592, you know, Cortes, I'm bringing, bringing you this information because I think it's important because not very many people know the history of that Southwest area. And so, you know, Cortes came oh, yeah, up. Please, please do. Yeah, when Cortes came, he came with indigenous Mexican, Mexicanos, um, but the indigenous, you know, because they had conquered the Aztecs and they kept on moving up and moving up and they hit El Paso and then they hit New Mexico. They kept on moving up. But at that time, of course, it was all open land. Um, and so, of course, they colonized the the Pueblo, um, you know, and as they were, you know, as they were colonizing, just like the colonizers on the East Coast, you know, they're also mixing. So in New Mexico, you know, we have the kind of like, we're kind of like a third, a third, and a third. So we have that third of the Spanish Castilian. So in Northern New Mexico, as, um, as the Spanish were moving up, so I'm in the Northern part, about an hour, two hours South of Colorado. 
And they, you know, the Spanish colonized all the way up through there. So in my area, we have Pueblo, um, the Pueblo natives. I mean, you go towards the West, you have the Navajo natives. We have very many, we have a lot of um, Native American tribes. And at the one time we also had Apache natives during the uh, civil rights time. So I bring all this up is because we have in, in New Mexico and my part, we still have a lot of influence of the Castilian Spanish, our dialect is sometimes can be different um, than our Mexican, you know, for Spanish from Mexico. And so when I moved to Albuquerque, I was working more with immigrant students and I would say words like, for example, like jacket in English, it was, I use chaqueta, but in Mexico they use chamarra. And so you have all the repertoire that you can move on. So the reason why I say Chicana is important to me, it's because I want to talk about that mix of who I am and that, and that it comes with the history and, um, and I'm different and I'm, being a Chicana is, you know, we're all, we're not a monolith, Latinos and Latinx, whatever you want to call us, we're not a monolith. And that's what happens in this country. We just try to categorize and label and minority monolith, you know, we're all one. You know, when we're just full of so many cultures and so many histories, um, it may be a little bit, it mean a lot, but I think I, I bring the history of New Mexico to the table because it's very diverse because we have our heritage language speakers. Um, and then we have our, our immigrant speakers like Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico per capita. We have the most um, Mexican immigrants in, in, in Santa Fe. Um, so. Uh, we are very influenced by so much culture in New Mexico. I mean, that's why they call it the love and enchantment. Um, so that's, yes, that was a lot, I know, but I want to make sure people know the big importance of history and behind why I identify as Chicana and why I have to understand there's Mexicanos and why there's Puerto Ricans. And I have to understand that there's different dialects. So for example, I taught adult ESL and I had Venezolanos, I had baseball players from Dominican. So right. people, you have a weird accent, you have a different accent when you speak Spanish. I'm like, well, it's like a mix. Like I have my, you know, it's like una mezcla, por aquí, por allá. And I bring it all together and I ha you have that language repertoire and you have that translanguaging and everything you could build off of. And that's why linguistic capital is so important. So thank you for even giving that historical context because I think it's imperative for people to know Mm -hmm. um, and when you talk about just the fact that the Latin X community is not monolithic, it speaks to this idea of intersectionality, right? Which yeah. we're starting to hear more about, especially with critical race theory and, and yes. Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, mm -hmm. who coined the term. Um, now we're starting to hear more in education where, all right, we can't create these policies and make it a one fit shoe all kind of model. Like we have to really dig in and, and look at the diversity within each of the different races. So I always wondered because there's so many different Spanish speaking countries, whether we talk about Mexico, uh, Cuba, or even like my, my mother-in-law's from Havana, which is, you know, considered Caribbean because you had a yeah. huge Jamaican influence there but they speak Spanish there as well. When you come across, when you talk about translanguaging, right? Oh, yes. Is there like elitism that happens? Because I've, I've heard this, but I want to know from you, like, do people feel like, oh, like, your Spanish is not okay. as and good as our Spanish? Like, we have, like, the best Spanish. Kind of like with English, like, if you go to the UK, Mm -hmm. They claim to have the most proper English because that's what they speak. But then you come here to America, we tend to take shortcuts with our English and they frown upon that. So does that same dynamic happen between different uh, Spanish speaking countries? I believe so. So, for example, um, I, the reason why I want I like this question is because in the bilingual, when I took my bilingual endorsement course, um, when they made la prueba, la prueba means the test, um, the exam. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, made it to where there's a part in there where we have to watch a video from northern New Mexico and they change the videos often depending on the form of the test. And so we have to watch the video and we have to understand through the context what they're talking about. So knowing that there's no formal, the formality of Spanish and, and informal and academic Spanish and, and how I speak Spanish in New Mexico is different from the Spanish in Mexico and Mexicanos will say, no, yeah, you know, you know, you're don't 
speak the right Spanish, you know? So there is that elitism, even the Castilian Spanish. Oh, you know, you don't, you know, they have a different, the, the both, the both otros and different things that are different, you know? And um, the one thing I will say is that, you know, I, uh, even with Colombianos, there's just so many dialects of Spanish that makes it so rich. Um, but yes, there is that elitism. I think there is, um, especially I see a lot in New Mexico because sometimes they don't, uh, Mexicanos don't like our, our music sometimes. Some of them, some of them don't like our, don't, not that they don't like it, but they don't acknowledge it as much as they acknowledge their Spanish. And um, yes, so, but there's even a, a, I don't know, there's just, it's, Translanguaging and and we talk about the differences in food. So I'm gonna go into the difference of a food. So you have New Mexico and Mexico where we love salsa, we love you know picante, hot. And then you go to right. the Dominican, they hate, they do not use spicy food in the Dominican. So when I was when I went to um, I was teaching a family and they were there, they're basically stranded in New Mexico for for Christmas. Their family came and and no, it's too hot. Salia picoso, no, it's too hot. We don't like they don't like hot. So, so again, even in the food, there's a diversity that we have to really even understand and know um, that I think is just very toxic again about how people put Hispanics into the monolithic area, the monolith, and even as basic as food, there's such a diverse way of way we eat as well in each Spanish speaking country. In area. Right. Yeah, and that part I know, but I'm always interested in just the, the translanguaging, because oh, yeah. even the Spanish that we learn mm -hmm. in our schools, different. Mm -hmm. We try to we try to speak that Spanish, and I don't know. You could choose whatever Spanish speaking country you want. They look at you kind of funny, but it's like, no, I'm speaking your language, exactly. but without realizing, oh no, there's actually subtleties and mm -hmm. and differences within the different dialects that mm -hmm. you may not be uh, cognizant about. Yeah, so like in New Mexico, like so in when you conjugate, like I'll say the word hablaste, like I talked to you yesterday, you know, I or talked hablaste, you know, when you conjugate it. Well, in northern New Mexico, um, with north our ancianos, with our older people, our elders, they say hablates. They mix the S and the T. So oh. that the reason why that sometimes some of our words are different in northern New Mexico is because the rural the rural areas weren't so, the Mexican Spanish didn't get there or the Castilian Spanish stayed within that area. And so you have the ablates and you have like, for example, the word leva. And you also have very many words that are also influenced from Pueblo, from the Pueblo natives as well. But just to let you know, Arabic, Spanish has between 4,000 and 6,000 words in Spanish from that are related to Arabic because the Moors were in Spain for almost a thousand years. So people don't realize how close we are, even to our Muslim brothers and sisters, and our and Islam and and in the Arabic speakers. There's so many similarities that there were wow. more, that were more identical, but between four thousand and six thousand words. So, for example, Albuquerque, the biggest school, biggest city in our in our state, the ALB. You know, arroz, albejón, anything with the ALB in the front is very is, is influenced by Arabic. Azúcar, just different words that are is influenced. So. It's just when I look into history, it just really fires me up because it, it really talks about identity. And that's why I love that you talk about identity and this conference. Right. And, and I think it's important, especially now, because I'm one that's always first to acknowledge that I don't know everything. And this is why I love to have these conversations, because it gives me a different lens into the different identities of different folks. Mm -hmm. And what you mentioned about the Arabic influence, in the Latinx community, I didn't even know that there was even that kind of connection until you mentioned it. So I appreciate you for even sharing that. But I do want to focus more on the challenges that exist in our K-12 schools, because I know you're in New Mexico where you have a very highly concentrated indigenous population, as well as a Latinx population. And when we talk about just change in schools, whether it's culture responsive teaching and just some of the other things, those two groups tend to get lost in the shuffle. They don't get centered as much as, let's say, you know, black community and, and others. So I right. guess I want to know from you, given your time in New Mexico and just your experience as an educator, 
what do you believe are some of the main issues and challenges that Latinx and I will even add indigenous students um, and teachers go through in K-12 schools? So in New Mexico, um, where we just uh, last year, two years ago, the Yazzie Martinez versus New Mexico Supreme Court came um, came through, and I will send you more information about that. But the Yazzie Martinez case basically showed that New Mexico was not providing equitable education or funding to our Latino and ELL and I mean emergent bilingual and um, indigenous schools. So from this from the Supreme Court, because in New Mexico we have the Indian Education Act, the Bilingual Education Act, and New Mexico is the only state in the country, of course, we can put Puerto Rico as a put territory, but New Mexico has English and Spanish as their two languages. But with mm -hmm. the you know, but with our acts in New Mexico, they found that yes, New Mexico did violate the way in which we educate our students. And from there, um, we have um, the way in which uh, they have and uh, have some legislation that I think is powerful um, that I can send you information on that just shows that this is what we need to do about, you know, the multicultural act, uh, the bilingual act, you know, different different um, ethics studies acts that have passed or that are in the, in, in the in stages of passing. Um, but I think that we also have a black, a black education, black student education act that also passed, which you don't have a black student education in the whole country. So that just passed. So we are doing some great things in New Mexico that I wish people would catch up on. Um, but there are still challenges, like you said, because we have the, you know, we have the east side of the, of the state where is, you know, a lot of uh, white, uh, white teachers a lot of english speakers that sometimes we do have that racism within our own our own between you know native new mexicans white and mexican so um the challenges i think are just making sure especially for our native communities um it was the internet you know we had a bunch of issues with the pandemic um, with our navajo nation and getting people being able to be connected um, and so they just also passed another connectivity act to make sure that all students are able to be connected to the internet. So um, I think the biggest challenge is, is that culturally responsive pedagogy and making sure that we're consistent. New Mexico, we're ahead of the game. Because coming from New Mexico to Kansas is a whole different story. I'm like, thank the Lord I was raised. I was raised. <laughs> I mean, they, I mean, I was thankful that I was raised and be able to teach in these schools to know what is expected in Kansas. So, I mean, is New Mexico perfect? No, but we are ahead of the game when it comes to culture responsive pedagogy. Um, but there's still those challenges that we're still working and these this legislation I feel is going to be strong in supporting that. And I would love to get that information because You're I don't know if I mentioned it to you. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, but um, I'm working on, on a new book project focused on um, anti-racism. And there are a lot of anti-racism books out there, but I don't think there are any books that really focus on each of the individual groups within the BIPOC acronym as far as what their specific challenges are. So I'm taking yeah. all this challenge and just trying to gather information. Okay. So what does that look like in the black context, which we know about very well because that's centered? But what's it little but what does it look like in the Asian context, the AAPI context, the, the indigenous context, the Latinx context, and also addressing the intersectionalities, which we touched on earlier. So I really want to get a comprehensive view yeah. of each of these because as teachers, if we're gonna be anti-racist or culturally relevant in our practice, we have to have at least a foundational understanding yes, of, of what those challenges are and how we can best support each of the groups within this movement. And, and, I, uh, and, and then again, BIPOC, again, um, in a monolith form, like, okay, we're, we're gonna, culturally relevant teaching, okay, we're gonna do this and it's gonna cover everyone. And everybody's gonna be covered by using this, by culturally relevant pedagogy, which I love to use, but culturally relevant pedagogy needs to be intentional. You're not just mm -hmm. going to throw something in there. And it's all about intention. Who's our audience? Who's our school community? And that's my biggest, um, my biggest um, feeling about our communities in New Mexico and our Hispanic communities and how do we serve them? 
um, knowing that we have to be culturally the relevant pedagogy means knowing our families, knowing our students, not just saying, here's a blanket. We're going to use, you know, we can get a training today and, and we're going to be able to do it tomorrow. Yes, exactly. And it kind of goes back to what you said about why you center your Chicana um, heritage and that label, because if you were to say Latinx, that is just such a generalized term because what's included in Latinx, right? Yes. You could be, I mean, you could be Mexican, you could be uh, Puerto Rican, you know, you could be from other Latin American countries. Who knows? It's just a, a blanket term, like you mentioned. And I think as even though I understand the the rationale behind the BIPOC term, you're trying to be inclusive. You want to make sure that you're, you're centering all the different uh, communities of color, but at right. the same, right? But then at the same time, we lose sight of the fact that there are intersectional identities within each of those. So even just within black community, yeah, yeah, people within the diaspora who don't like to mess with people who actually grew up in the continent. There's some inner conflict there, right? Um, and just because, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I mean to interrupt you. I think I'm a little bit delayed. Um, even in no the even the um, even in the university context as well. You know, what I mean, I think that it's also there's also that understanding of um, of how we teach our students as well, um, and also to say that um, how do we and also you know like you know you know the the fastest growing population of students in the United States are mixed race. So yes. our kids. I mean, BIPOC is like, whoo, that's a whole another blanket because we have to really understand that our students, I'm mixed. You know what I mean? There's so many students, mixed race students. But anyway, and again, the intersectionality, that's so important of understanding that. And do teachers understand what that word means? Um, some teachers here where I teach, you know, I teach the FISL at the TESOL courses and the first time they ever hear about intersectionality is sometimes in our courses. And and that's very true, and that's something that has to change for sure. But yeah. while while we transition into the what you're doing now at Kansas State University, because you are a doctoral candidate and you're doing a lot of great research on how we can better support our culturally, linguistically yeah, diverse family. That's why I like saying instead of BIPOC, you know, I that's why like we use uh, you know. My, my supervisor in our books, in the books, uh, Biography Driven Instruction, and her books, we use culturally and linguistically diverse students because it, it gives capital, it gives, it's not, we're just not labeling, we're saying, you know, you're culturally diverse, but it's beautiful. You're linguistically diverse, but you're included. And you may be black, you may be Asian, you may be you know, Hispanic, you may be, you know, special education, that's a diverse community. You know, our LBGTQ families, um, even our lower, you know, our class, lower SES students, that all comes together. And so that's why I like using the term culturally and linguistically diverse, because it's, to me, it's not a negative term. And that's why I don't like using English language learners. I like using emergent bilinguals or emerging bilinguals, because we don't want them to lose their first, their first language. We don't want them to lose their first culture. We want them to understand that that's their, that's their identity. And that's what's so strong about community cultural wealth uh, by Tara Yoso, that it was, you know, first, um, you know, captured, they designed it um, for students of color within the college environment. And that's where it was first coined. And then, of course, it's like, I call it like CRT, um, uh, like critical race theory in action, because it's actually, how do we, this framework, you know, is, is the, how do we understand our students of color and how they access, again, college, school, the institutions with that strength-based perspective and capital. Um, and not capital with money, not income capital, but right. community, cultural wealth, community. And that's why I th this is so empowering. And it empowers individuals. You know, like you have capital. You speak two languages, you, you have capital. You you went through the immigration system, you, got ca you have capital because you understand how to do those forms. You have that fund of knowledge. So again, it's not this deficit perspective. It's not... I, I am who I am despite of the despite of what happened with my family. No, I am who I am because of my situation. I am who I am because of this happened to me. I am who I am because of my culture, not despite of. And we have to change that narrative. And I think that that's why I love, again, your conference, because it's about identity. And how does community cultural wealth even refer 
to the parent, to the teachers and the students and the families. So that's why I love um, community cultural wealth so much because it refers to so much and it has so much to build on. Um, and it's so personalized, can be so personalized to a school. Right. And uh, before we touch on the framework of community cultural wealth, which I definitely want to learn more about, I do want to build on what you were saying about just having that linguistic versatility. Because if you've read Dr. Jamil Lee Scott's book, Black Apps yeah. Taiwan Food, she talks about this uh, when she's referring to her poem, Three Ways to Speak English. Because, you know, in the Black community, you know, there's Ebonics and then there's these other slang terms that we use with our friends and in our home. But then when we get to school, we're speaking the proper English. And there was a part in the story where she asked herself, what's caused me to make that switch the minute I step foot into my school building? Mm -hmm. And I, I think when we talk about whiteness and just how white supremacy culture manifests itself in our school communities, that's a huge part of it, right? Yeah. Just this idea of language and, and how we feel like the language that we speak with our families and our community members sometimes is not considered proper, but who makes that determination? Why are we conditioned to think in that way? And, and, and uh, that's the one thing I would like, I, I'm glad that you bring that up. It's because I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Jose Medina. Um, he's a big, uh, he does a C six by literacy framework. Um, but he's a, you know, he's a, a, a LGBTQ uh, leader, a community leader. And he has a many, uh, a lot of different, um, uh, uh, he talks about linguistic liberation. So that linguistic liberation talks about how, you know, we have the power as educators to, to say, you know, this is part of your language repertoire. Like I talked about earlier. Okay. I know the word jacket. But I also know the word chaqueta, but I also know the word leva. I also know the word chamarra, you know, and so that is part of your mm. linguistic equitor, so, uh, repertoire. So we need to be able to make sure that, that students understand we have inf you know, informality and formality depends on the dominant culture, right? But we cannot cut students off and say, oh, you're saying that wrong. You know, even in Spanish, I can't say, oh, pues, and people say, pos. I can't say, stop talking like that. You know, it's like saying, oh, you know what? You know, I like how you said that when you, you know, I like how you said this word, but we can also say this. You know, how do we say, how do we turn it to say, you know, this is part of who you are. This is part of your linguistic capital. But this is something that you can work from. And it's also part of a fund of knowledge. So not only are we doing it with these different words and formalities, it always mean, mean something. It makes meaning to the student. So when we tell students that that's not right and the formality and, and the way you speak and this and that, regardless of whatever English it is, whatever formality it is, we have to make sure that we are saying this is part of your linguistic repertoire. You can speak what you want, but when we do different activities, we're going to say it in this register or that register. Not to say that what you're saying is wrong, but you know, in this context, we're going to write it like this. But know that you can build from that in your experiential knowledge. So that's so important. What's where translanguaging comes in and the importance of that. Uh, and thank you for mentioning that. And this is why. I look at a lot of the Midwest states, particularly, you know, where you are in Mexico and, and even Arizona, where you have your highly concentrated indigenous and ethnic communities. You mean Southwest? Like Southwest, right. Like Southwest. Southwest. Sorry, Southwest. Southwest. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. See, this is why I was a math teacher, not social studies teacher. <laughs> yeah. Let me just like so that we make sure that we there you go. Because here in the Midwest, they'll probably you know like sometimes I have teachers and 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 others that don't even know New Mexico and all that exists sometimes. So, but anyway, yeah. Right. But I was just saying, like you are ahead of the game in terms of well, what it Mexico. looks like to preserve culture like how you preserve your culture and, and stay true to that. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you go to a lot of other states within our country, they're not even thinking about that. They're not, they're not centering you know, those identities in the way that you all are. So how can we get 
other communities to catch up to that, you know, is really the biggest question because clearly it's happening, you know, in your home state and in other parts. And we, we need to follow that blueprint. Policy, policies and legislation. I mean, you had in Arizona where they had book bans. I mean, you can even read it. Books about you probably couldn't even read a book. The book about um about uh Cesar Chavez. You couldn't read a book. Any books about Malcolm X. You know, so there are book bans in New Mexico, and I mean not in New Mexico, but in Arizona, and we're still fighting for ethnic studies. And there's legislation and policy that needs to be put in place that actually is going to influence that. And that's where um, I'm hoping with this new Department of Education uh, secretary that we can dig into that and stop with the other civil rights, stop uh, violating the, the cultures and linguistic models of our families and our students. Right. Now, at Kansas State, you're doing your research mm -hmm. primarily on the community culture wealth framework. And I was able to do a little bit of reading around it. So I know there are six different types of capital, if I'm not mistaken. Um, some of them, which I know about because I've experienced it, obviously the social capital, which is just being yeah. able to have the multiple networks and to ingratiate yourself with different people in order to get this advancement. Uh, but what are the, but there are like five other ones. And I, if you could touch on them very briefly, um, just to give some context, that would be awesome. Yes, um, so we have our aspirational capital, and I like how she places this first because those are your beliefs and your dreams. And we know because we had some some things, some challenges we may have had, that's who we are, and it's not going to stop our aspirations and dreams from coming true. Um, that's aspirational capital. And then we have our linguistic capital, we've already talked about, of having that language and being even, like you said, even to styles. You know, linguistic capital is not just the language, it's also the style of the language. Um, and then you have um, how we have our familial capital and it refers to the importance of those familial ties, immediate and extended. Um, as you know, uh, you know, our, our black and Hispanic um, communities, we, we, everyone's an auntie, a tia, you know, when it comes to family. It's not just kin, it's also but by kind. Um, that's how mm -hmm. Terry Watson talks about it. Dr. Terry Watson does an amazing job of how she applies. Um, I'm using her study a lot in my work. Um, how she uses um, the studies, community cultural wealth with leadership within a school. Um, and then you have your social capital, like you said, the networks of people. But the networks of people and your navigational capital are so important um, because, you know, how do you navigate the system? Who do you call for that social capital? Who you know? And then that navigational capital, we need to understand that. You, you, say you talked about white supremacy and the way that systems are built. Well, the systems weren't built for us. The systems were built on that, you know, on that on that white perspective, that white spectrum of class and of like, you know, the white, like the white supremacy. And so, again, um, it's also how you code switch. That's what Dr. Dr. Watson talks about code switching, even within your navigational capital, even with who you are and how you navigate the system. And then also that power of being able to navigate the system, like the immigration system, like uh, the school systems in the South, like they're different. So how do you navigate that? And how do you navigate maybe getting SNAP or getting different um, services? And also resi uh, resistant capital is based on the, you know, our experiences as diverse communities and how that, how that struggle makes us stronger and how it's, you know, and how we're trying to secure, we're trying to have equity, we're trying to have that social justice. So those are the other um, capital. So again, you have aspirational capital, linguistic capital, familial capital, social capital, uh, navigational capital and resistant capital. And remember, they all build upon each other. That's what I love about this is like, it's all part of who the community is. It's not just say, oh, you have some linguistic capital. Oh, you have some social capital. No, it all builds on each other to make the students resilient and to make the families resilient. And again, builds on the identity of, of who's in the school and of the student of the families. Wow, this this is just gold, this is gold. And as you were talking, I was thinking about the aspirational capital. And I want to hone in on that for a second, because as you know, we've heard a lot of talk about anti-Asian racism. You've definitely heard about, you know, anti-Blackness and, and even within our own communities. And it's the same, I'm pretty sure, in a lot of the Latinx communities as well. But 
What I want to know is how can one build aspirational capital if these manifestations are taking place within their K-12 school communities? Because you have teachers that do everything possible to not put you in the position to build on that capital, which is so important um, in our school communities. Yeah, and it's, we have to teach to give hope. You know, I think that in our in our schools, and that's what it is, hopes and dreams and building off of that. And like you said, we have their anti-blackness, anti, you know, and then, you know, you start bringing in, oh, cancel culture and all these different words just to, like, I feel like just to um, not even think about the real issues. You know, how is how am I? What is my intentionality? I want my child, a student, to walk out of my classroom to have that hope. You know, to I can give them that hope by identifying, by knowing who they are and validating who they are. So again, again, hopes and dreams. Um, it's empowering. Community cultural wealth is just empowering. And how do we make sure that we? I say, I see you. I see you. I know we've had our your struggles. I know that you work hard, but I see you, and I know who you are because of this. So it's empowering. Um, that's how. It's important to say, I see you. I know who you are. I want to talk about the navigational capital for a second as well, because we, we've we heard about code switching for a long time and how a lot of us had to code switch, which in our context meant having to leave some of our humanity at the door mm -hmm. or of our identity at the door in order to navigate the different yeah. systems. So when I... so. Maybe I'm not thinking about it in the, you know, I'm looking at it from a, I guess from a negative standpoint, but I guess it could also be affirmative too, navigational capital, because that's what you need in order to help disrupt these systems. You have to know how they work. You have to know how they function. And yes. that requires you to do that homework in order to properly navigate those different paths in order to get to that destination that you need to interrupt. Yes, and it's also and also knowing the people, like so like I said, social capital and and uh, navigational capital work in tandem, you know. And right. And and I like I said, I'll send you also um, in my presentation for the conference. I do have a link to Dr. Terry Watson's um, article, and she's the one that says it's like code switching. It's like knowing where you're at, knowing who you are, knowing what context you're in, knowing what you have to do, even knowing the formality of the language that you have to speak in order to go and talk to these people, talk to people to help you to navigate, talk to the counselors, talk to, not even the counselors, talk to, have an, have an, inter, have an interview, um, things of that sort. Um, so I think that that's important for us to know. Hold on one second. Sorry, my mom was calling. Um, but yeah, so that's important is the understanding to be able to go from school to the social networks to different things um, to be able to, to be successful. And not just in school, but in the social aspect and in, in, in succeeding. And do you believe that if we can get this framework in more of our teacher education programs, oh. we definitely see a change in the way in which yes. our pre-service teachers come in uh, to teach our students because yes. I wish I had this knowledge in my teacher ed program, which I finished over a decade ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, we weren't talking about this stuff, but now 2021 with everything going on, we, we need to, and I can't stress this enough, we need to focus on what every single community can bring to the table yes, in order to make the school a strong place. Um, yes, if we don't, if we don't do that, you know, like I will be honest with you, even in um, colleges, even having working with white families, with the dominant culture families, family engagement period is not touched enough in schools, I mean, in, in pre-service programs. I mean, there needs, there are some university programs that do have it and it's part of the, um, you know, the structure, but there's so many that are not in the United States that we have to go off our own sociocultural background or our own uh, context, our own schema to understand well, uh, what would our families enjoy? What would our families need? And and we need, I think you need at least, I would say, you know, if, if, if as, as we know how strong family is, us, us as teachers and having a strong family union and building together 
why can't we study that and make sure we understand that in these pre-service programs to, to talk about that with our teachers? It's just, like I said, there are some out there, but not enough, you know, not enough at all. Oh, well, yeah, for sure. And I think I have one more question before we get to the lightning round. Okay. And we did start to touch on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what I want to know from you is what are some specific actions that educators and school districts can take to center the cultural, historical, and lived experiences of the Latinx community? So we're not just talking about one community. We're talking about mm -hmm. the intersectional identities within the Latinx community mm -hmm. um, in K-12 education. How can we do it in a way that is genuine and with fidelity? I think with teachers in the classroom, just starting with that funds of knowledge. Who is in your classroom? Um, you know, what do they bring from home? What is their experiential knowledge and validating that? Um, also, I think it's important that we, it is part of our culture of the school, part of our ecology of care. Who is in our community? You know, like um, Dr. Bristol, um, Travis Bristol talked about how when he was doing some teaching and, and sending his teachers out, they would actually go to the community and know it. And I'll be honest with you, when I taught in, in Albuquerque, I did that too. I stayed in that community in that area. If our teachers do not make connections with the communities in which they, um, you know, they do their own research, they may not have a large, like here in, in Manhattan, Kansas, they're not a large community of Latinos, but there are some. But if you don't, maybe you not have, may not have the context, but you need to go research. You need to go find out about them. And that's why it's so important to know the biographies of the family. Um, you know, understand what part of Mexico they're from. Understand, again, that they're not just a monolith and really understanding the biographies of the students and not just um, not just this umbrella. Um, but again, um, again, making sure that we are part of, making sure we know their identity, where they come from, their linguistic capital, who's important in their life, and making sure that that's part of the culture and what we build in the classroom and the school and being more inclusive and in ensuring too that we have more communication lines open, you know, on social media. Um, you know, how do you run your school? How do you communicate with families? Because, you know, many, many, um, many families, some are millennials, some are parents are millennials. How do you communicate to your school on Instagram, on social media? Do you do it in Spanish or in English? What language do you use to discuss, to communicate with your families? If, when, you know, so that's where, um, you know, I, I, there's just so much for me that, that we need to do. But again, I think it's focusing again on the funds of knowledge, who our families are in the classroom, who our families are in the school community, and as well as what policies do we have that can be very hurtful? How what legislation is out there that is hurtful to the communities and how do we rectify that even within our board policies, our school policies as well. And just one final note on the community cultural wealth framework. I believe that it's a framework that affirms the power of stakeholders, particularly our community members, because when we yes. talk about legislation and policy, a huge reason why it happens is because our stakeholders don't recognize their power. They don't recognize the capital that they possess within yes. them, right? So, that's why I love it when you talk about, you know, this framework of the different types of capital, because it ties into the importance of community and the role they play in agitating and disrupting, but it also speaks to the importance of affirming the intersectionalities of the different identities within the BIPOC acronym. So there's some multiple uses of this framework just based on what you were saying. Yes. With, with that, um, it's just so important. Again, it's empowering, like you said, um, and, and, just like, and and that's how you build a true school community. You know, um, there's in New Mexico, they're starting a lot with community schools. And I think it's so important, you know, how do we relate to the community and how do we let them know that they're important? And that's why like in New Mexico, in, in, this, in the country we live in, you know, if you walk in with a Spanish speaking accent, you look down upon it. You know, it's required for you to learn English, whereas you have a dominant English speaker who's learning Spanish. And oh, they're learning Spanish. It's wonderful. 
where you have a, an emergent bilingual coming in school who's not only learning how to communicate with their peers, but they're also learning academically. You have your Bix and your Kelps, and they don't want to be known as Hispanic. They don't want to be known as, as Mexican. They don't want to be known with that culture because, again, how do we look at the families when they walk in? Look at what are, you know, what look at the last four years. They made Mexicanos, you know, they made them out to be drug dealers and, and the context and th those types of ideas of our Hispanic families, our Latinx families, continue to uh, permeate in our buildings and that needs to stop. But again, we have to value our, our emergent bilingual families and we have to give them the resources and value their identity and say, you know, you're going to be bilingual. Guess what? You're not going to only know um, English, but you're going to, I mean, you're not going to only know Spanish, but you're going to know English and you're going to be able to go back and forth. We have to add value and this is part of your identity and this is who you are and we can't lose it within the way that we are teaching or learning. Very well put. And I wish we had more time to really delve into this because there's so many avenues we can go with this. So many avenues. Let me know well, if you want me back later on. I don't mind delving into like another <laughs> later. Don't mind at all. Um, a conversation that needs to be had. No, definitely. Because I definitely have some questions to, to ask you off air for sure. Uh, because I'm now, my synapses are, they're just operating right now like crazy. So uh, why don't we go into the lightning round? Sure. And I have a few questions. Could we want to get to know oh. Latanya a little bit more, right? So what's your favorite self-care activity right now? With all the disrupting you're trying to do, how do you take care of yourself? Um, exercise. <laughs> exercise. Um, uh, reading other stuff. I don't get to read that much. Reading other books. Like right now I'm reading a, a, a memoir. Um, going back. I can't even see that. So many things in my mind. I can't even tell you the memoir I'm reading because I'm reading so many things. I try to read, but I'm reading so much that I am trying to get back to that reading for enjoyment. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is exercising, swimming. I started swimming again. And um, and taking time for me just to breathe, even if it's 15-minute nap, self-care. That's about all I can do. I don't have time. I'm a single mom of three <laughs> working on my dissertation and working full-time. So self-care comes in, in spurts. <laughs> get it in where, you know, get in where you can fit it in, right? Not if not, we, we just defeat ourselves. We can't fill our, you know, if we don't fill our own cup, you know, we can't help others. And I mean, I say it, but yeah. I'm not always the best at demonstrating it. So I'm still a work in progress with regard to that. Yeah. All right. If you can invite three influential figures, dead or alive, to dinner, who would they be? Uh, Dolores Huerta. Um, she worked with Cesar Chavez. Um, who else would I invite? I would invite, uh, well, my father passed away when I was younger, so I invite my father. <laughs> um, and then uh, also probably uh, Michelle Obama. Yeah, that's probably- That's a popular be. choice. Yes, yeah. But the Lotus Huerta, Michelle Obama, they, they've they been uh, speaking to me a lot lately in, in what I'm doing with, with my work. Awesome. And then a question about your hometown. So you're from Las Vegas, New Mexico. New Mexico. Is there any, is there any connection between We're Las Vegas, Nevada and, and your hometown? Las Vegas means the meadows. So um, okay. Las Vegas is the wildest of the wild, wild west. So they say we have a lot of Billy the Kid, a lot of background. Um, in terms of, you know, the Wild West aspect. Um, uh, but no, there's no connection between Las Vegas, Nevada, and Las Vegas, New Mexico. We're the original little town. All right. You know. No <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. You go out there. You, you say that. <laughs> and then um, my final question is, if you were an educator, if this wasn't your career path, what would you be doing? Do you so have like I a dream job? Civil rights journey. Um, okay. That's what I wanted to be. Or, uh, or uh, the other one I was going to, I want to be an FBI agent or I wanted to go into um, criminology, but I was like, I don't do guns. I don't like guns. So they gave me my expo marker at the time was chalk. Um, and then I, I just felt like I, uh, civil rights has always been a big thing of mine. So a civil rights attorney would probably be my dream job. Wow. That's awesome. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, man, we have a mother, a scholar, an activist, just doing it all. So, Latanya, thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak with us. Appreciate you. Thank you for taking the time and rearranging your schedule. I appreciate that. No, I, I just, we needed to have you on. So I'm glad that we were able to work it out and you were able to just share a little bit about yourself and, and all the great work you're doing. So so thank you again. And uh, we'll definitely connect about those resources because I think there's so much value in those resources. Yeah, so I'll send you that next week and the, and the Dr. Watson and, and different things I talked about, I'll send it to you because the New Mexico stuff, I think, is the I mean, New Mexico rules and the legislation and the policies, I think, are monumental and could be helpful to many states in our country. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. All right, good people. So there you have it. Uh, we're about to end another phenomenal episode of Identity Talk for Educators Live. And before we go, uh, just a few reminders. Uh, number one, we have our Identity Talk apparel shop where we're bringing out some new designs, uh, some new accessories in the coming months. So make sure you check us out at the Teesprings shop at teesprings.com backslash stores backslash the identity talk apparel shop and then finally we have our stay true to the teacher and youth summit coming up april 16th and as latanya already mentioned she's going to be one of our presenters um, at the summit and she's going to be talking more about community cultural wealth there. So if you're someone that's interested in some of the information you heard today from Latanya with regard to that, make sure you tap into the conference uh, happening April 16th through 19th. All the sessions will be pre-recorded. So if you're in the class during that time, no worries. You'll still have an opportunity to check it out and to replay all the sessions because you'll have that access. So make sure you uh, check us out there and, and join us for this summit. And that is basically it for me. So until next time, good people, I wish you all a good morning, good afternoon, good night, whether you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody.